Hello everyone, welcome to Health for the World International Grand Rounds. Please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you are logging in from. The topic for today's Grand Rounds is Sport of Systemic Pathways and Interventions, and it is my pleasure to introduce the speaker for this week, Dr. Van Nguyen. Dr. Nguyen trained in Diagnostic Radiology at the Maine Medical Center and subsequently specialized in Vascular Interventional Radiology at Brown University, where he currently serves as the Assistant Professor of Diagnostic Imaging. He's also the President of our Brown chapter and has helped us organize this month's grand round. So I wanted to thank you, Dr. Nguyen, for that. Um, and we will have a Q&A session after the talk. So please feel free to add any questions you may have in the Q&A box or in the chat box, and we'll get to them after the after Dr. Nguyen's lecture. And courtesy of Brown University for this month, all of our lectures qualify for an AMA PRA category one credit for US-based physicians. So please claim the credit using the barcode on the screen after the lecture. And without further ado, Dr. Nian, please take it away. All right. Thank you guys uh, very much. Uh, thank you, Avana, for organizing this and uh, thanks for joining me this morning. Uh, again, my name is Van Nguyen. I'm one of the uh, radiologists at Brown Medical School. Uh, my area of expertise is interventional radiology. But I also do a fair amount of diagnostic imaging and interpretations. So my talk today is going to focus in on portosystemic pathways, um, as well as some of the interventions that we've done in the past. Um, and just like Avinov uh, mentioned, uh, this talk qualifies for our CME credit for our US-based physicians. So I'll leave this slide up for a few seconds here so that you can kind of take either take a picture of the uh, survey monkey link or the actual QR code. So feel free to claim credit if you can. Right. I have uh, no financial disclosures. I wish I did, but I don't. So uh, we are going to be doing an imaging review today uh, of portal hypertension, uh, namely in the setting of you know, cirrhosis, things that we commonly encounter uh, here on an everyday basis, understanding what portal hypertension actually means and the physiology of uh, portal hypertension and then the eventual pathophysiology. Um, portal systemic pathways uh, are going to be something that we're going to encounter in the setting of portal hypertension on imaging and being able to recognize those pathways as well as the eventual development of varices. Um, and then uh, we're going to review some cases where we see some of the clinical complications associated with portal hypertension and varices and some of the endovascular um, treatment options that we've been able to um, use uh, in interventional radiology. So, you know, from the standpoint of portal hypertension, um, it's something that the knowledge and understanding of your portal anatomy and the flow dynamics is going to be very vital for recognition of it on imaging, knowing some of the manifestations of it, uh, and also being able to see some of the more typical and atypical locations for um, uh, portal systemic flow and eventual variceal development. Um, so portal hypertension is defined as a portal systemic pressure gradient of five or greater. Um, you can measure it from a direct standpoint or an indirect standpoint. But what you're looking at is the uh, pressure between the systemic side, usually measured at the level of the hepatic vein um, and the uh, portal vein. So when we look at portal hypertension and the classifications of it, it can be defined as either prehepatic, intrahepatic, or post-hepatic, depending on the location of the, the blockage of flow. Overwhelmingly, we um, encounter portal hypertension uh, where we are in the setting of uh, intrahepatic portal hypertension, namely cirrhosis. Um, but you can kind of see here is a graphical depiction of the different sort of etiologies that can um, manifest with uh, portal hypertension. So as hypertension progresses, flow, which generally goes from in the direction to the liver, what we call hepatopetal, um, can eventually, because of the pressure, uh, the hypertension, 
can cause the flow to actually go in the reverse direction, which we call hepatofugal, which is away from the liver. So um, when pressure gradient exceeds eight millimeters of mercury, um, collateral vessels start to develop at these different sites of communication between the portal system and systemic circulation and your body's natural you know, um, way to try to decompress itself. So this is just a, a simple illustration showing you that there are multiple different potential areas where your body is doing its best to try to decompress itself by directing flow away from the liver back into the systemic circulation. So when your body is able to do that naturally, we call those spontaneous portosystemic shunts. Um, and here are, are a few examples of these sort of uh, spontaneous shunts that um, is nice to be able to recognize uh, on imaging, namely on CT imaging. But this is an example of a paraumbilical shunt, uh, something that's present in up to a third of uh, patients with portal hypertension. Um, but in, in when your body's uh, efforts to decompress itself, these uh, dilated paraumbilical veins along the falciform ligament start to engorge, and you can see that on CT imaging. And here's the arrow pointing to it. And then as the flow goes in reverse and decompresses itself, it goes down along uh, multiple varices that are enlarged along the abdominal wall and the epigastric veins. And here you can kind of see right there what that looks like. And then eventually it dribbles all the way down and enters back into the systemic circulation um, by going into the uh, femoral vein in this instance. And so from a clinical standpoint, you can kind of see this is responsible for that kind of kaput medusa uh, appearance on patients. A spinal renal shunt is another commonly encountered shunt and up to a fifth of patients with uh, cirrhosis. Um, it can present clinically with hepatic encephalopathy um, because what you have is flow that is being diverted away from the normal filtration of the hepatic sinusoids and is going directly back into the systemic circulation. So any of the you know, ammonia um, uh, byproducts from the gut um, no longer goes to the liver and because it's being shunted away, um, it can go directly into the systemic circulation and cause some of the clinical manifestations of hepatic encephalopathy. Um, when you see these shunts, uh, just also be on the lookout for underlying portal vein thrombosis because that can also induce um, formation of these shunts, but here's an example of a spontaneous porosystemic shunt right here, where the, go, the shunt goes from the splenic vein um, into the left renal vein here. And here on a coronal view, you can kind of see that dumping back into the left renal vein. And this just is an example of a different cut of the same patient uh, who has splenic vein. Um, or portal vein uh, thrombosis, uh, pretty much at the spinal confluence. Um, a gastrorenal shunt is something that is also commonly encountered on CT imaging. Um, it's something that arises in a vast majority of those with gastric varices. Uh, these patients can present with uh, upper GI bleeding. Um, here you can kind of see what that looks like, these large serpiginous vessels at the uh, gastroesophageal junction there. Um, and this is just a nice example of gastric varices right there, uh, leading into a gastrorenal shunt. Again, the shunt goes from these varices into the left renal vein. Uh, this is an example of something um, that you know, you'll see in textbook. Um, this is not related to underlying portal hypertension, but it's actually a reversal flow from the systemic side, um, but this is a nice example of a patient uh, uh, that I've seen recently that has um, what we call the hot quadrate sign or a hyper enhancement of uh, segment four of the liver. Um, on first pass, it looks like a lesion, but it's considered a pseudo lesion, um, but it results from obstruction on the systemic side, namely the SVC. Um, but what it does is cause shunting to go from the systemic side down and back into the portal system. And so here you can kind of see uh, a lesion right here that's pretty much encasing and blocking the SVC. But what it does is 
flow goes backwards, goes down the internal thoracic vein or the internal mammary vein, as it used to be called. Um, and then flow actually just goes through the, what we call the vein of sappy, um, and then communicates to these small branches that go into the left uh, branch of the portal vein. And because of that, you see that sort of picture. Esophageal varices, far and away the most common type of varices that are going to be present uh, both on imaging as uh, well as clinically. It's present in up to 80% of those with cirrhosis. Um, variceal bleeding commonly occurs at a portal systemic gradient of 12 or greater. Um, and you know the, the evaluation and management of esophageal varices has been the most extensively studied, and which is why the, the management with a TIPS or a procedure or a transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunt is namely for the uh, management of esophageal varices. And it's been shown that getting that pressure gradient below 12 is going to be generally successful in controlling any sort of esophageal variceal bleeding. Um, and these patients obviously can present uh, with either hematemesis or melanoma. And here's just a picture of esophageal varices on imaging. I'll direct your attention here to a dilated azagous vein. And this is just an example of a portal venogram on that same patient where we went directly into, uh, through the liver, into the portal vein. And with our injection, you can see the enlarged varices, but then also that communication directly into the uh, systemic azagous system there. Uh, gastric varices are less prevalent than esophageal varices, but uh, something that is of clinical importance is that these things are definitely, or generally get bigger um, than esophageal varices. And when they do bleed, they're much harder, much more difficult to control, uh, particularly endoscopically. There's a higher mortality rate associated with these things. Um, but uh, so from the standpoint of uh, these uh, sort of patients, uh, we do get involved in it uh, from an endovascular standpoint, um, but here's a CT of a patient with gastric varices who underwent a GI bleeding protocol. So you kind of see the different phases here. Um, this right here is a coronal image uh, with, or during an arterial phase, early arterial phase, and this is a more of a delayed phase. And so sometimes that can affect your visualization of varices depending on the contrast bolus timing. But here's just a nice illustration of the gastric varices right there, but also there's a nice gastrorenal shunt that allows, you know, potentially an, an, um, an endovascular approach towards treatment of it. So uh, this patient actually is a patient that, you know, we treated by using what we call the, the Borto procedure, which is essentially a balloon occluded retrograde transvenous obliteration. It's just a fancy term, but what it's saying is that um, with the existence of these different portal systemic shunts, it allows us a way to, um, you know, uh, I wouldn't call it easily, but uh, allows us a way to access um, through the systemic circulation into the portal circulation and potentially treat these offending lesions. Um, the reason it's called balloon included is because the flow naturally goes from the portal side and decompresses into the systemic side. So in order to be able to um, uh, illustrate these things under fluoroscopy, you have to put something that's gonna occlude the flow and push in contrast a visualizing agent against the flow. So that's why you have to put a balloon up. And here you can kind of see um, the contrast filling the gastric varices. It's also important to know that when you're doing it under pressure, you also are able to delineate certain systemic communications um, from these varices. So here's just an illustration of flow that's going through the phrenic vein back into the IVC right here. And then this one goes up the pericardial vein and then dumps into the brachiocephalic vein. So those are important things to actually recognize because if you are gonna treat these patients, you always wanna make sure that where is the treatment, whether it's an embolic agent that you're using um, the medication, the fluorescent that you're using, uh, where is it actually going to end up? 
Do you want to be delivering it through there and then potentially extending it to the lung, the systemic circulation, things of that sort? So that's always important to be able to recognize uh, when you're actually doing these things. Um, but, you know, for this patient, we ended up doing a sclerosis of the gastric varices by using a foam uh, mixture. Um, here in the States, we, uh, at least in our institution, we use a mixture of air, sodium sotradecol, and lapidol. Um, the sodium sotradecol is an agent that's a, a sclerosis that causes inflammation and ultimately thrombosis uh, of these enlarged veins. Um, the lapidol is another agent that we, we mix in. Um, it also has embolic properties, but the main uh, utility of it is that it does show up as radio opaque on imaging. So by mixing it together, you're able to see how well your medication is dispersing um, and to visualize it fluoroscopically. The reason we put air in and mix it into a foam is that that increases the surface area, the, the contact uh, surface area of the medication it allows the medication to insinuate um, into all these different, you know, uh, areas um, of the varices and helps it travel further. So uh, once we do that, we can occlude the shunt itself uh, by either coiling it or putting a, a plug or something in that uh, shunt to kind of keep this medication sitting in there to be able to, to do its work and cause that eventual thrombosis. So on follow-up imaging, uh, just know that the lapidol mixture uh, shows up as, you know, bright on CT imaging. So this is a non-contrast CT, but here you can kind of see uh, that lapidol mixture. You see some bubbles here from just some residual gas that was mixed in. But uh, the lapidol, also known as ethiodol, is derived from poppy seed oil. It's a radiopaque contrast agent. It will be radiodense on uh, non-con. So um, a C minus C plus. Uh, non-contrast and then a contrast enhanced CT uh, will help determine, um, be able to help you figure out if there's any sort of residual filling of uh, varices. Um, the important thing to also understand in the setting of doing any sort of um, eradication of these veins and these shunts is that, you know, what you're doing is essentially uh, destroying the that your body's natural mechanism of trying to decompress itself. Obviously, your body's way of trying to decompress itself is not good enough, which is how patients present with bleeding um, and, and, and things of that sort, because the body's been overwhelmed by the portal venous pressure. So in that sense, you're helping the patient overcome the acute complication, but at the same time, you are aggravating the underlying portal hypertension by closing down that, that pathway that your body was using to keep the portal pressures a little bit under control. And here you can kind of see on follow-up imaging later on how this patient who did not have any ascites started forming ascites, uh, perihepatic and perisplenic ascites afterwards because their portal hypertension was aggravated. Ectopic varices are called ectopic because they are in less common locations but it's also important to be able to recognize that um, on imaging. They are uh, also um, something um, that is a source of, of bleeding and morbidity. Um, they can uh, present with hemodynamically significant hemorrhage or um, uh, bleeding that is uh, unresponsive to conventional treatments, both medically and endoscopically. Um, they're not very well understood um, or studied, so Treatment can be, can be very difficult and it can be very variable depending on um, local expertise. But um, these uh, are poor systemic collaterals that can occur at uh, sites other than the gastroesophageal uh, region. And so that can include duodenum, other places like jejunum, um, in the rectal area or peristomal, as well as some other places that I'll show you on subsequent slides. Uh, this is just an example of a patient with uh, Cirrhosis, hepatic cellular carcinoma, right upper quadrant pain came in for a right upper quadrant ultrasound with Doppler. And here you can see this patient had portal vein, looks like portal vein thrombosis. But if I direct you to this area right here of the gallbladder, um, you have without color imaging, it looks like a very thick and irregular gallbladder. But with color, you can kind of see these large serpiginous color flow here. And this is just a picture of a patient 
um, with uh, gallbladder varices. Um, so just uh, I'm another manifestation of underlying portal hypertension from cirrhosis. And this is just a picture of the, at least uh, part of the thrombus in the portal vein. But um, it's just a nice uh, correlation and illustration of gallbladder varices. Um, this is a patient who had a peristomal varices that actually was bleeding. Um, but uh, just know that, you know, a patient uh, with cirrhosis can definitely have uh, varices in this location, and that can be very, very difficult to control endoscopically. Um, but this patient was um, treated with direct ultrasound guided access into those varices and directly embolized with an agent, um, usually like a STS or thrombin or something of that sort. Uh, this is an example of a patient with peritoneal carcinomatosis and IVC thrombosis, but um, has retroperitoneal varices. So something uh, to think about um, in, in the setting uh, of a patient uh, with potential um, underlying hypertension or some sort of obstruction. Uh, but here, uh, depending on the contrast phase imaging, it can be very difficult to, to visualize. Um, but here you can kind of see uh, this looks like something that, you know, may be mistaken for adenopathy or a mass or things of that sort, but actually it's all vascular. So um, it's important to kind of keep that in mind before you engage in something like a, a biopsy or, or something that, that could lead to worsening of a patient's condition. Um, this is a patient who had a hematochesia and abdominal pain for a day. Um, underwent a GI bleeding protocol in our ER. So uh, GI bleed protocol, um, as I mentioned earlier, has a non-contrast phase uh, where you're able to take a look um, and look at things that are hyperdense so that it's not confused with uh, contrast extravasation. Uh, but then the second phase uh, is the arterial phase where you're looking for any sort of arterial um, extravasation and then we have a delayed phase where you're looking for um, additional uh, confirmation of something you saw on the earlier arterial phase, such as pooling of blood, continued extravasation, and things of that sort. But here, uh, you can kind of see how it can be difficult to visualize um, any sort of um, vascular abnormality in this region. This looks like almost like soft tissue, again, like adenopathy or mass or things of that sort. But here on a delayed, you see it all filling in. So this patient actually had a duodenal varices that was bleeding. Um, so this patient actually did not have any sort of portosystemic shunt or readily available, but was bleeding and was not uh, in a state where it could be managed just uh, conservatively. So uh, this is a case that actually went to interventional radiology. And um, sometimes we have to go in through a direct access uh, to the portal system. And that can be done from a percutaneous transhepatic going through the liver, or we can go in through the spleen. Um, at, uh, the goal is to be able to get into this, the portal system, either through the portal branch or the splenic vein branch. Um, and here you can kind of see this patient, we went in through the splenic side and put a catheter down. And here, as it goes through, you can kind of see the filling of the varices as well as outlining of the bowel there because this patient is actively bleeding. So contrast is filling the varices and then just filling into the duodenum there. And this is just a, another angle, but here you can kind of see it again, um, contrast filling these varices and then outlining the valvulae conventes of small bowel. And then, um, you know, depending on the operator uh, and the comfort level with different sclerosis, this patient was actually uh, treated with a mixture of um, glue, which is, uh, you know, uh, what we call NBCA or N-butyl cyanoacrylate um, here in the States. Uh, we mix it with lapidol, but you can kind of see it going in and just occluding it. Um, 
this is an example of a patient who, um, a young guy with uh, cirrhosis, um, but uh, he had recurrent uh, bleeding rectal varices, uh, prior failed endoscopic treatment. He also had uh, underlying hepatic encephalopathy. Um, but here is just a picture of his, uh, his varices um, in the, the rectal region. Um, and just, just remember that picture. Um, and then, but then look at the CT. Uh, the CT shows how much, how the extent of his varices, stuff that you would see that's sitting on the outside of the rectal wall that the endoscopist uh, would not be able to see with direct visualization. So um, you can kind of get a sense of why sometimes endoscopic treatment can fail. Because if you're going here and just injecting some of these with a you know, direct injection, um, on the outside, or I'm sorry, along the mucosa, you can kind of see how much you're actually missing uh, on imaging and why uh, management can eventually fail. So this patient also did not have any obvious poor systemic shunting. Um, so from our approach, what we did was we did a percutaneous transhepatic access into the portal vein. Um, here you kind of see here, so uh, you're able to go directly through the liver and into the the uh, portal vein itself. And here's just a, a contrast uh, study um, injection where you see the portal vein, you see the splenic vein, you see the SMV, the IMV, and then the left uh, gastric vein there. But our goal was to be able to go down here and through the IMV into the superior rectal vein and then access the varices. So here you can kind of see what that looks like. And then, um, we did another, you know, pressurized injection, which delineated those uh, rectal varices that kind of correspond to what we saw on CT. And you can kind of see the extent of those varices compared to what was seen endoscopically and know that, hey, you know, you have to be able to treat all this before this patient's gonna have some sort of durable um, improvement. And so, you know, we treated it with the same um, mix foam mixture that uh, was uh, I mentioned earlier for our gastric varices of uh, air, sodium sulfidecol, lapiodol, and then we cool the inflow into those varices, which kind of trap those uh, the sclerosa in here. But here you kind of see what that looks like. This is just a Foley catheter that's sitting in the urinary bladder, but this is just the one of the final images of the the treated varices. And then on six month follow up colonoscopy, you can kind of see how great this looks. And uh, this was not the patient, but this is the way he acted afterwards, I'm sure. Um, and so this is actually one of my favorite cases uh, recently. But uh, what we have here is a 78 year old male with uh, gross hematuria and, quote, bladder mass. If you take a look at this, the, the date here, this is back in 2019. This was done at an outside uh, office clinic, but this is a single phase study. And here you can see right there um, what looks like this kind of lobulated mass, soft tissue mass. I, I, think, uh, I think we would all pretty much agree that that's something that looks you know, suspicious and was called you know, suspicious for a, you know, a bladder lesion a bladder malignancy. Um, so this patient, you know, generally is kind of healthy person, um, but he was at an age where he and his family were extremely stressed out about this. Um, saw a urologist, but you know, once they heard the different options, uh, elected not to pursue anything because they did not uh, want to undergo any possible cystectomy, um, bladder resection, uh, chemotherapy, things of that sort. Um, did not want to change what he was doing in his life. So uh, pretty much said, hey, I'm, I'm ready, to, ready to just live with this tumor and potentially die with this tumor. Um, so that was in 2019. Uh, showed up back at the hospital, one of our hospitals, and uh, 21. Uh, so about over almost two years later, um, but came in with uh, you know, hematuria, hematuria uh, enough where he required hospitalization and transfusions. And during that stay, they got a CT scan. And here you can kind of see he's got some cirrhotic changes. He wasn't a drinker, but 
actually found out he had a history of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. hepatitis. Um, so had some cirrhosis related to that. Um, but here you kind of see as we go lower, the contrast uh, phase shows this kind of enlarged um, flow uh, down the internal uh, inferior mesentery vein. And then that in turn feeds into what was previously described as a bladder mass, but now we know it wasn't a bladder mass as much as it was enlarged varices that are encompassing nearly the entire uh, wall here of the urinary bladder. And here you can kind of see on a coronal view what that looks like. And I just pointed an arrow right here because Again, it's very much like a tip of the iceberg phenomenon uh, where the urologist goes in and he saw a couple of vessels against the wall there, injected it, and obviously this patient didn't respond to that, right? Because how could he possibly see exactly what he was actually up against uh, in this setting? Because what you're seeing are tiny little vessels on the wall, but on the outside, these massive enlarged varices. So, um, I was consulted and just started reading into this, but uh, this is an example of a portal hypersensitive fasciculopathy, extremely rare um, phenomenon, but uh, only saw a few cases reported in literature. A couple of cases of uh, endovascular access and embolization was uh, described in Korea and Japan in kind of small case reports. So um, with that sort of uh, knowledge and uh, experience, I decided to uh, try to help out this gentleman. So um, took him to our hospital uh, where this is just a simple ultrasound over the bladder where you can kind of see the, the enlarged varices and the, the flow that's associated with it. Um, but again, we, uh, there was no systemic uh, portal um, collateral that we could access. So we went uh, direct transhepatic portal access again. And this is what the portal venogram shows. So you can kind of see the enlarged inferior mesenteric vein with flow going down this way. And then as we engaged it further, you can kind of see those massive bladder varices. And then we did a, another venogram with a balloon up. And again, we see those varices. So I uh, used a couple of different methods of trying to um, occlude it by using both the, the foam sclerosant. After injecting it, we used a, a coil to try to pack it in. And here you can kind of see what that looks like. And then finally, we also use um, glue, uh, a glue embolization to try to make it a tighter pack. And then our final run shows pretty good cessation of flow there. And then just, you know, as we looked under ultrasound while we were injecting it, you can kind of see what this looks like, just the foam, the foam air um, just flows through these uh, varices like that. So it shows up as a uh, echogenic under ultrasound. And then on six week follow up, um, patient did well clinically, but we wanted to see if there was any sort of residual filling. Um, and so this is the non contrast phase of the exam. So you can kind of see the artifact from the uh, sclerosant, the coils, and the, the lapidol show up right there. So that's important to kind of see on the non contrast phase. And then once we do the, the contrast phase, you can evaluate for any sort of um, additional enhancement that could show whether or not there were residual varices, which we did not see. So just in summary, um, you know, understanding the hemodynamic alterations and portal hypertension is going to help with our recognition of some of the common and uncommon pathways on imaging. Um, it's important to know that based on the, the contrast phase 
particularly in you know uncommon or ectopic uh, locations, um, not to for uh, not to always assume it's going to be some sort of mass lesion or adenopathy. Just make sure that you know a vascular lesion is in your differential uh, diagnosis. Um, knowing the, the the things that we do in in interventional radiology, um, identifying possible portosystemic entry and exit points on imaging can be extremely helpful, um, particularly for your IR colleagues, uh, if you are to, to recognize it and mention it, um, because you know during procedural planning, it can be very helpful um, as in terms of knowing uh, what are the possible ways to be able to go in and actually help these patients. All right, so that concludes my talk. Um, these are my references. These are my um, acknowledgments and this is, again, that slide for uh, CME credit. Um, and uh, hopefully you guys were able to kind of enjoy this and I'm happy to take any questions you guys may have. Thank you, Dr. Nguyen, for the interesting collection of cases. Um, we do have one question as of now, and they ask, what CT technique do you prefer um, or suggest to assess collateral vessels, a three-phase liver CT or an abdominal CTA? Right. So uh, when you're talking about collateral, um, when you're talking about looking for uh, whether it's a bleeding, a patient who's bleeding, or if you are uh, trying to do some sort of um, planning, uh, particularly for in the venous side, um, a three-phase uh, bleeding protocol is what we generally use and which I generally prefer. Um, so we do the non-contrast. Uh, part of it. Um, and by looking at the arterial phase, be able to see if there's any sort of um, uh, arterial uh, contribution, um, if this is an arterial lesion. But the delay phase um, allows you to uh, delineate any sort of venous, um, whether it's venous bleeding or any sort of venous lesion or filling of the, that sort. So just to answer your ultimately to answer your question, a three phase uh, is how we generally work up any sort of patient who's coming in with bleeding or planning for to treat something of that sort. Mm, thank you. I think we don't have any more questions, so um, I guess that concludes our grand rounds for this week. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nguyen, again for helping us organize this month's grand rounds and. Uh, taking the time out of your schedule for this and I, that concludes our grand rounds for this week great awesome thank you very much for having me and uh we'll uh, be back next week to, to give another one so uh thank you very much for your time and uh i will uh i will log off at this point okay thank you <laughs>